Uh, welcome back to the second half of this workshop. We were dealing with the question of the mind as an obstacle to the journey within. The truth is there is no other obstacle. If uh, we had a large number of enemies to fight, we would have to deploy several kinds of weapons, different kinds of strategies to deal with this enemy on this front, this enemy on the other front, this enemy on this front. There are so many enemies to take care of. But in the spiritual journey, there is only one enemy. At least we know the enemy is localized and one. And that's our own mind inside ourselves, not outside. In a way, it makes it easier to fight the mind on our own grounds, being inside ourselves. On the other hand, it becomes difficult because the mind has already usurped too much territory. It belongs to us. We started identifying ourselves with the mind, started following the mind. We forgot that old genie story. Remember the genie story? Anybody who doesn't remember the genie story, please raise your hand. If there are enough votes, I'll repeat the story. Okay. The story is about a guy called Aladdin who found a lamp and when he rubbed it, a genie appeared. And the genie said, I am your slave. Command what I shall do for you. So Aladdin was surprised to see such a big, frightening, spiteful genie. So he said, go and build a big home, big house outside and then come to me. Thinking that way he'll put the genie off for a while. Within a few minutes, the genie was back. The house is ready. Command what I shall do now. Aladdin said, go and make a long bridge over the ocean. In a few moments, the bridge was ready. Whatever commands Aladdin would give, the genie would execute them so promptly that soon Aladdin had no more commands to give. So he said, do what you like. The genie said, come on, now I'll tell you. We'll go here, we'll go there. So instead of Aladdin giving commands to his slave, the genie, the genie began to tell Aladdin what to do. This is our state. We've got such a beautiful slave, such a beautiful servant called the human mind. And instead of telling the mind what to do, we started asking the mind, what shall I do next? And we are following what the mind tells us. We have reversed the role. To continue the analogy with the genie, one day a friend of Aladdin came and said, Aladdin, you used to be such a happy-go-lucky fellow, carefree. What's happened to you? I find you are always worried now. He says, I used to be very happy, but since I got this powerful slave, he is taking me everywhere, driving me crazy. I don't know what to do. Made my life into a mess. Everything he tells me, now go and do this. Now things fall apart, don't go right. Everybody misunderstands me. This genie is responsible for all this. So that friend of his said, Oh, you mean you have no commands to give to the genie? He says, no, I ran out of command. It's so He's so efficient and so fast. So the friend said, I'll give you a solution to your problem. Go to the forest and bring a wooden pole. Get a wooden pole and bring it to your home and dig it in the center of your room. So when the genie says, command what I shall do next, tell the genie, go up and down this pole. Till I give you the next command. So keep the genie busy, up and down, up and down. When you want to make use of the genie, say, get off the pole, do this for me. When genie has done it, say, get back to the pole, up and down. And down. This is the teaching of the master for us. That if we don't know how to handle the mind and the mind has started handling us, keep the mind busy between work that you give to the mind. How do you keep the mind busy? By digging a pole behind the eyes and keeping the mind busy, repeating something, getting involved in, a, in business that keeps the mind here. This particular process of keeping the mind busy in the head is called mantra. You ever heard the word mantra? What is mantra? Mantra is certain words given to keep the genie busy, to keep the mind busy repeating when we don't need it. Therefore, we should make good use of the mantra. Repetition of words which can keep the mind busy. We repeat those words with the mind, keep on repeating. When we have to use the mind, we do something. We bring it back and start repeating again. That way, we can control the mind 
and get back our rightful place in the great third eye center behind these eyes. That is why traditionally the mystics and the masters have given a mantra, a, a word or a set of spoken words which we can give to the mind to speak. There are two kinds of words. One are the spoken words and the other is the unspoken word. The spoken word can be written, translated, distributed, put into book form and all the scriptures are in fact the spoken word representing truth. But then there is the unspoken word. The unspoken word cannot be written, cannot be printed, cannot be distributed, but can be heard. So, in this practice of mantra, we use two kinds of mantra, the varan atmak, which means one that the soul or the complex of consciousness can speak out to keep the mind busy, and the mantra which cannot be spoken but can only be heard, which we call the inner music or the uh, sound of the cosmos or the original word, the unspoken word, the resonance which created everything, the creator of consciousness, the sustainer, the inner fiber of consciousness is that resonance which can be heard but cannot be spoken. Both these words rest here behind the eyes. We put the mind to work to repeat the mantra which is a spoken word in order that we may get some respite from the mind and relax in the chair behind the eyes. If we ever relax in the chair behind the eyes, we can automatically hear the music, the great sound, the great resonance, the vibration inside which is coming automatically from consciousness and not from anywhere outside. Therefore, from the spoken word, we go on to the unspoken word. It is amazing that this unspoken word which creates everything because it is the creator of consciousness has been referred to by every teacher in whose name we have set up religions here. Every teacher. I sometimes marveled how much similarity there could be in this area of knowledge in all the cultures of the world. In the Bible, in St. John's Gospel opening verse talks of this. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. What more explicit statement could you hear? In the Sanskrit Vedas, written maybe 10,000 years ago or 13,000 years ago, it says the great sound and the word alone created everything including the creator. In the Rig Veda, there is a reference that it is that sound which created even the creator. In the Islamic religions, they say the Bange Asmani, the sound of the skies alone created all that we can see here. You go into other cultures, you find references to Subud, to Shabad, to Naam, to Word, to Holy Ghost, to the everlasting melody, to Om. There are so many words being used to describe the power of a sound which cannot be written but can be heard. And attribute of creation, creativity itself is given to that word. So the real royal road to the inward journey is to get hold of that word. If you can get hold of that word and listen to it, you can go stage by stage to the highest level that I talk about. Because nothing will pull you closer to the center of your own self than the resonance coming from the center of your own self. Here you have to try to shift your attention from one thing to the other. When you listen to that sound within, you don't have to try to shift your attention anywhere. The attention is drawn by that sound to your own self. It's coming from the self. Therefore, that's an easy way. The royal road, the royal spiritual road is to listen to the sound within your own self. Now, that sound which is reverberating in everybody, it has no discrimination at all. It resounds in every human being, in every country, every part of this globe, in every age. It doesn't bother whether your skin is white or black or gray or in between or green. I don't know what are the different colors of the skin. It doesn't bother about nationality, it doesn't bother about language. It resounds inside whether you are a good man or a bad man, whether you are a gangster or a thief or a, or a priest or a spiritual leader. That resonance, that word is there in each one of us without discrimination. And that is the resonance, the real unspoken word which we have to reach in order to get back to the inner journey.
if we can hear that, nothing like it. When do we hear it? We hear it, then our attention, a small part of our attention is gathered behind the eyes in that chair when we are sitting there. You can try that. When the mind becomes still and doesn't speak too much and you sit in the chair, this sound will come automatically. Nobody will place it in you. It is automatic, natural. It is as natural as everything else made by God. It's not made by man. It's been there ever since this universe was created. So that resonance and sound and words, unspoken word, is the real key that dissolves the differences of what should be one's outward attitude and inward attitude. How do you reconcile your worldly duties with the inward duties? Because everything becomes a product of that word. You will find that consciousness which has roots in that word. Consciousness operates both to make us aware and to create the object of awareness. But we don't use it in that sense. We use it in the sense that the vibration of consciousness, the resonance of consciousness can create something because of its resonance is power. And then we have to use another part of our awareness to pick it up through sensory perception and know it. We divide it artificially. But if we are used to listening to that word, this artificial division, whether you are creating or picking up what you are creating, disappears. And the whole show becomes a unified, single field of energy in which the show is taking place with only one substance as the show and the witness of the show, that being Shabad, that sound, that word. The word is the only reality. So it is great to be able to hear such a sound which can lead us to the ultimate reality. How does that sound sound? How can you recognize it? Sound has many variations. But at the level of the threshold, the threshold level is when we just pull our attention from this outside world and put it back just behind the eyes, the sound is like a resonance of a bell. You heard a bell? Dong, dong, dong. This kind of a resonant bell is an automatic sound that is going on when we pull our attention back. No wonder all the churches put up the bell top of the steeple. They didn't know why. They said it was to call the worshippers. Call where? It was ringing here. The architects of religious buildings for years have been imitating the real temple of God to make the artificial temples of God. They constructed the dome like the top of the head. They put steeples like the headgear worn in their contemporary age. They made the outside church and temple and synagogue and house of worship look like the real house of worship which we carry with us all the time. And they put the sound of the bell where it is coming from within as a symbol to draw our attention lest we forget that this is the call. The call is to go and listen to the sound within. But we went into the external symbols and external brick and mortar and stone made things and thought that was everything. We began to kill people over those buildings which we made ourselves outside and we destroyed in large numbers the real temples of God in order to preserve those copies. This is our history. What a strange thing we did because we were misled by the mind into materialism, into externalism and forgot the truth within. The truth within still resounds the same way. Anybody can go and listen to it. So the truth of the bell ringing inside is there. Before one listens to the bell, when one tries to practice sitting behind the eyes, some other sounds come, which are referred to by the mystics as practice sounds. Because they are not true spiritual sounds with the power to pull you to the core. The bell sound can pull you. If any one of you has heard that bell sound is in, it has got such a power and a pull and magnetism, it can take you through the journeys and the different regions by itself, by its own power. But before you get that, in order to practice listening to the sound, a number of sounds associated with the physical body and with your sensory system, with the astral body, they come up, which are like chirping of birds, the chirping of crickets, the, the sound of an echo of a like a, like a train or a locomotive coming and stopping in a covered shed, 
like a train crossing a bridge, like a little thunder, like cloud having some lightning and thunder, uh, like a waterfall. These are different sounds that will come automatically if we try to concentrate on being there, being behind the eyes. These sounds are natural. I was surprised when I went to one place and a very good speaker who was a speaker uh, in uh, one of the conventions. Uh, he was so worried about these sounds till he heard me speak and said, I didn't know I was making progress. He was going to doctors. But there must be something wrong with the ear. Where are these sounds coming from? There is no external source. But these sounds are internal. They come from the soul. They come from consciousness. They come from the self. And they are helpful in pulling us towards the self. The practice sounds do not have the pull, but they help in the gathering of scattered attention because the practice of listening brings you back to the point from where you are listening. Therefore, listening intently to the sound helps you. If you cannot hear the sound, then listen intently to the repetition of the mantra being done by the mind. So, mantra is the first stage to listen and be there. Practice sounds are the second stage. Listen and be there. You can drop mantra at that time. And the real sound which has that resonance and power is the ultimate way to the journey within and that pulls you to all the levels I spoke of. This is the beautiful way, royal way to the journey within. I have said all this in advance because you may not have to ask questions. Why did we have any sound? Does anybody ever have recollection of hearing any sounds during meditation? Good. The sign of progress. It's a natural sign of progress and more will come. And as it comes, give up everything else. You don't have to put any effort. Relax and listen to the sound. The only thing required to do is listening. Listening is the secret. The more you listen, the more you get. Speaking is not the secret. Listening is the secret. The more you listen, the more you center yourself. If you become a good listener, generally in, in the world, you will be more successful. If you become a good listener within, you will be spiritually successful. So listening is a very good thing. When we have to train the mind to repeat the mantra, it takes time. The mind likes to run away into other thoughts. Because the mantra is performing a very mechanical function to meet the mechanical obstacle of the mind. When you repeat certain words or a word and keep on repeating, what you are really trying to do is to choke the mind out of other words that you are thinking. Supposing a thought is going in the mind and you start repeating a word in the same channel, the thought has no place to be there. Therefore, it is really like squeezing out the words of thought by putting in the words of mantra. Supposing the mind accepts that word and starts mechanically repeating the word of mantra and then jumps to the next channel to comment upon it. Are you speaking too fast? Are you doing it slow? Is that the way? How long are you going to do it? The mind keeps on speaking while you think you are doing mantra by repeating it. In that case, the answer is not to enter into argument, but to make the commentator also repeat the mantra. If a third voice comes up, make the third voice join in, not start again, join in with the mantra already going in. If some other image comes in front of you, some friend's face comes and the friend starts speaking to you, don't interrupt that. Let the mantra go on, make the friend join in and speak at the same time. Very successful meditators have had a chorus of this mantra going on in their head and therefore there was nobody to block them and the progress was very fast. So, there is a technique of how to overcome these obstacles that the mind creates. We will now start an experimenting. How many of you have a mantra which you can repeat? You raise your hand. Use your own mantra. Those who don't have any words can coin a temporary mantra. Can coin a few words of expression of love. Because when you want to express love, you are touching your spiritual self. Therefore, even if you put it down in words, you are picking up the best available temporary mantra till a master can share some other words with you. At this point, I would like to tell you that the mantra a master shares with us or the simran or the words he asks us to repeat are chosen by him from a level of association of ideas to which we do not have access here in the physical plane. But as we go up, 
we find in the mental level that those words are our own words. You understand that a spoken word makes meaning because of its association of ideas with an earlier experience. When I say this is a glass of water, you understand it because these words, glass of water, have been heard by you, learnt by you with earlier experience of glass of water. If you didn't have that, the word would mean nothing. It would be just a sound. These sounds become words, the phonetic symbols take on meaning because of the association they have with earlier experiences. When the master gives us a mantra, he is actually giving us words which have an association of ours with a higher experience in the devolution to this level of illusion, but we don't know in the illusion. When we rise above the illusion, we find out those were our words and had meaning at that level. And therefore, sometimes those words have great power, though we've forgotten their meaning. And people say, how can mantra be powerful? That is why it's powerful. Because it has connotation at a higher level of consciousness, in our own self, not an outside. So, the mantra serves many other purposes also. I am not going too much into details of what, what it does. Right now, it is good if you can coin a mantra that comes from the spirit being an expression of love and associated with an experience of love. You can take a beloved's name. You can take an expression of your love for the beloved. You can remember a scene in your own life when it was effective. and Use those words for the mechanical benefit of wiping out from the mental screen other thoughts that are coming in. So keep on repeating the same words that you pick up now. And keep on repeating and eventually you will find when other words of thought come, you keep the other channel also open to repeat the same words. So two voices should be heard inside the head. The third comes, bring a third one. If some other image starts speaking, let the image also speak. If you have to create more images to speak the same words, let them all. The whole chorus inside should be repeating the same words. And when that happens, you don't let go of your chair and you'll move on from the spoken word to the unspoken word. Shall we try? Use the existing mantra or a coined mantra. Sit behind the eyes. Get into the mansion, sixth floor. Check the hardness of your floor. Move back as much as you can. Check the hardness of the floor, stay behind the eyes, enlarge the area, get into the image that you put there, let the mind repeat the word and you sit and listen. Let your mind, the thinking mind, switch over from other thoughts into repetition of the word and you relax in the chair behind the eyes and listen. Begin. Repeat slowly and deliberately. Not like a fast machine. So you can listen to each syllable. Slow, deliberate repetition. Don't leave the center. Stay in the center. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Look. These uh, exercises are supposed to be done for much more extended period, normally not less than 15 minutes to half an hour. But uh, because of the duration of this workshop, I am just giving you samplers. They are all sampler exercises, not real. So you can practice them again later. The idea is to get to know what is going on and how we are going about it. In the exercise we just did, we tried to use artificial words to replace the words of thought and we tried to still stay in the third eye center. We did not make provision in this exercise for the images to come in front of us. The repetition of a mantra is called Sumiran or Simran. Simran is the repetition of a mantra in order to control the mind, to keep it in check. To create a similar image in front of you and hold that image to replace other images that the mind creates is called dhyan or contemplation of a face. Since nothing is more conducive to spiritual growth than 
holding on to the face of somebody you love, if you have a beloved's face, you can do appropriate dhyan by holding the beloved's face. If you have a spiritual master and he has kindled the love in your heart, it is appropriate to have the master's face in front of you as a means of contemplation. So thereby you can contemplate the face, use the mantra and keep the mind in check for the whole exercise till the other sound comes. When that sound comes, you can give up everything and listen to the inner resonance and travel with it. If the resonance comes and goes away, then you get back to the other exercise till it comes again. When it comes, hold on, latch on to the resonance and give up the other exercise. It is not difficult to contemplate the face of a person you love. You can close your eyes and figure out the face or remember an event and the face comes up. In the case of a truly enlightened master, it's not that easy. The mind cannot make up that face easily. Especially the eyes and the forehead and this section of the face is very difficult for the mind to imagine. And uh, in fact, that's one of the tests you can apply. And therefore, when you try to imagine the face, this section continuously tries to disappear. If it does not disappear, then you might as well talk to the master because he is there. In the real form, of the Shabad or the sound within you. The external form of a spiritually awakened master is only a projection of the real master within, whose real form is the same resonance and the same sound. It's very difficult to explain at this stage how the creator is also the creation and is also the master and also the journey within, and that is that sound or resonance. So the sound and resonance holds the key to all these questions that we have. But it takes time. Till then, we go on by the different degrees of illusion. Like we think a guru or a teacher is an outside person. If the guru is real and is teaching us the real journey within, after a while, he will tell us to go within. And when we go within, we find an image and we find contact with the sound and we find the real nature and real form of the teacher who was always within. And the outward one merely came to put us in touch with the real one. The real teacher is always within. But we have no contact with the real teacher within. Therefore, as a catalyst, as a means to reach the real teacher, the outward image comes and helps us. So the contemplation of the outward image, if it is perfect, leads us to get in touch with the real form of the teacher himself. But these methods, of simran or repetition of words to keep the mind busy, of dhyan to contemplate the face of the beloved, and of listening to dhun or the resonance or shabad. These three methods can take us from where we are up to the highest levels of consciousness. The techniques are very simple. When we are initiated by a master, he just gives us these three elements. He gives us the words to repeat for Simran. He kindles in us a certain love and devotion which helps us in contemplation. And he puts us in touch with the inner sound which we can hear and makes the journey easy. Initiation is only these three things. Initiation is not a formality. Initiation is a link of our inner attention with the inner sound. It's a link between our inner self and our inner guides that takes us to our higher self. So, initiation is not an outside formality. But since we are always looking for everything outside, the master at this level appear outside, function outside of us, talk to us as if they are talking from outside. Once in a while they give answers when we don't ask questions. Then they bother us because they are not outside then. Or they do other miraculous things which later on keep on convincing us they are already inside. But in the beginning, they function like beings outside and they perform their role from outside and gradually move the scene of spiritual growth inside. So when they give the initiation outside, they make it a formal, mechanical, external thing of sharing with their disciples the words to be repeated and the manner in which the sounds can be heard 
and a few other meditational practices. When they do that, they say you are now initiated. It does not mean that you are only initiated if that formality is taking place. The real initiation can be felt inside when we have a very strong seeking inside. I remember the great master had a very interesting disciple once who came from a far off city and travelled for a month he had to travel to reach the headquarters of the master and all that month he was pining to have a, a view of the master, a darshan, to look at his face. He, he had never seen him before, but he just wanted to see him. He felt he was going to see the face of God. Something was happening so much for the whole month as he travelled. He was full of that seeking for the two. So when he reached the great master, he said, Master, will you accept me as your disciple? Will you initiate me? And the master said, Why? Didn't I do that a month ago? You were initiated a month ago. Oh, you want the formality? Come sit down. I'll do it now. I am trying to remove some delusions people may have that it is a formality of outside ceremony. These true mystics and masters don't come here to set up more delusions. We are already full of them. They come here to take us out of delusion, out of superstition, out of rituals and ceremonies. They find we are already trapped in these. They want to pull us out of these into reality. So they are so compassionate, so full of love. They give us things in their own way. We don't understand in their own way. So they have to give us in our way. But they do it even then with laughter, with compassion, with a sense of humor. Their sense of humor is amazing. I have sometimes wondered where they got it from. But then I, I remember there are eight senses. You must have heard that story which I frequently tell of the eight senses of man. Five are senses of perception. Seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling. These five perceptions or senses are just the senses of perception and are built into physical and astral system. But they are not the senses which make us go up the ladder, any ladder. The one sense that makes us go above these five senses is called the sixth sense. It's called sixth sense because it is above these five. So one who has the sixth sense, which is intuition, is ahead of those who only use five senses. So, sixth sense or intuition is more important as a sense than the five senses of perception. But the seventh sense is even more important than the sixth. And that seventh sense is common sense, which is very uncommon. Common sense is the ability to distinguish between the grain and the chaff. To know this is important, this is unimportant. Leave everything unimportant behind. To set the priorities right. To be able to set priorities in life right, you need common sense. And that is more important than the other physical senses. But the eighth sense is the highest sense of all. And that is the sense of humor. The ability to laugh. The ability to laugh at one's own situation. To laugh it away. One who can do that must be a successful person. Therefore, the sense of humor is very important. And in our dealings and relationships with these masters, we find their unique humanness as well as their unique sense of humor and their uncanny way to become so ordinary that we make them our friends and become so extraordinary that we begin to have a feeling, a suspicion. He knows. So he may say, I don't know. You get the feeling, he knows. And when you become a friend, if you really knew, it's very difficult to become a friend. If a master were really an extraordinary person with extraordinary power, we will appreciate that person, we will admire, we will look at it in awe and wonder but we will never become friends. Because awe and wonder is different from friendship. Friendship involves love. Friendship is reserved for the ordinary. If a master came flying in the air, four feet above the ground, everybody in this audience will get struck by the wonder, what's happened? But nobody will love that master. If by chance he trips and falls here, Diane will get up and say, Oh, are you hurt? I'm sorry, and she'll have a strange feeling of love for that guy who's fallen down rather than the one who's flying in the sky. Because love is a strange feeling, an attribute, a function of the spirit in us that reaches out for the ordinary. 
as ordinary as us, something like us. Therefore, these masters perform a dual function of being totally ordinary like us. They can act ignorant, they can act stupid, they can act like we do and make us so comfortable with them and then in the process of getting this knowledge, they can act as if they know everything, as if all the answers are there. So, this strange combination comes in these masters who have already achieved that level of consciousness of where they operate. So, when we fall in love with these masters, it's not that we have to cultivate that love, how to love these masters, we don't have to learn any lessons. Their very way of acting, their very way of coming into our life, their very entry makes us feel love in our heart. And though we sometimes wonder what's happening, because it is of a different quality, that love is of a different quality than the one we are used to in this world. We have been calling our attachments and our relationships as love. And here is something real happening where there is no demand upon us, there is no price to pay for it, there are no conditions to it, and yet the feeling is so real. The feeling of, of being together, feeling of oneness, feeling of identification, feeling of somebody caring, feeling of being taken care of, that feeling is so strong. But that becomes the experience of spiritual love and that is how the masters operate. If we are told that effort will give us nothing, we get nothing. If we are told make all your effort and see what you can get, we make all our effort and then we get nothing and then we are told effort will give us nothing, then effortlessness gives us something. This is because the mind is so constructed, it does not accept that it can't achieve on its own effort. Therefore, to make the mind lazy and to say no effort is needed, just relax and sit, doesn't make the mind believe that this can happen. Therefore, the mind continues to play the same games with us. The ego game, the game of obstructing us, the game of distracting us, the game of attachment and desire for this world, the material games keep on going. But if the mind tries very hard, tries so hard, it ultimately says, I fail, I couldn't do it. The master smile and they say, okay, you are ready for the next phase. And you say, why didn't you stop me in the beginning when I was trying so hard? And the master says, because when you were trying so hard, if I had stopped you, you would have just postponed the rest of the trying. You would have got nothing. Now you have tried so hard, been driven to the wall, you know trying doesn't help, you are ready for the effortless meditation. So mind is a very strange thing that we are encountering. All these techniques I share with you, as you go within, you will find the nature of the mind coming up. Now, we will do the exercise in a combination of repetition of the words, contemplation of the face of the beloved, sitting quietly in the chair with love and devotion and watching what happens. But never letting go of the center, never going down to sleep. Stay awake. Stay awake even if you have to keep the effort of keeping awake. Awake inside, not outside. Get back to the third eye center that position is often referred to as third eye center because that's the eye, single eye from which you can see everything and all the light is filled up when you have a single eye. When these two eyes, when you start looking from behind these eyes, looks like the eyes converge. As you go to the third eye center and watch, you are not watching with two eyes. These are two eyes but gradually you find that your vision outside is still stretching from a single point like this, as if these two eyes are drawing the power of seeing from a single point which is a single eye or the third eye. And when reference is made in the Bible, if thy eye be single, thy whole body shall be filled with light, it is reference to that third eye. If you can withdraw your attention behind these eyes to that single point behind, this very body and the front darkness in front of you will be filled with light. Let's see. Get to the third eye center and use love and devotion to establish your attitude, simran, repetition of the word to block the mind from thinking in words, contemplation of the beloved's face to block the mind from putting any other images. The more consistently you can put these three together, the faster will be your progress towards the journey with it. Begin. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, 
Why? Open your eyes. Any of you enjoying this exercise? Please raise your hands if you would like it. Thank you. That's good. Any of you didn't want me to stop? Good. That's good. This workshop has succeeded already. That this kind of interest has been built up. If you enjoy being there, you like being there, you will make good progress. Everything is there. All the treasure houses are buried there. You'll find them there. I am very sorry I had to interrupt all these exercises in the middle because of constraint of time. Any question or sharing at this time? You would like to share your experience or your questions or comments? Yes. If we were to have a mantra which is designed for working inward, yet our mind wanders greatly as mind does during the day, would it be poor use of a mantra to use it outside to keep our mind together? Yes, the mantra should be used all the time, outside and inside. Yes. I have a question about when you say master, which has been on my mind for quite a while. I don't know if you're speaking of like a living master or someone that is sitting next to me, you know, or could it be Jesus or? I am speaking of a living master, a living human being to whom you can address a question who can chide and scold you and not let you follow your mind. That kind of man. Why Why not a, a master who is passed on? What, what would be wrong supposing like Jesus or a master who passed on? My master, great master in his physical body passed on. Why not that master? Why should you have a living master? Because when you want to address yourself to that master, you may be addressing your own mind and getting answers from your own mind. A living master is necessary to avoid that contingency that when we go to a past master who has died, who is not living in physical body, in flesh, if he is not made of flesh at this time and cannot talk to us as another human being, the answers we get from a so-called earlier master may not be from that master at all, but from our own mind. And therefore the mind can deceive us. In fact, it has happened most of the time. People have been misled on this issue. They found a master, but he was not alive. And they kept on getting answers and words and sounds and languages, which they continued to ascribe to a master. Till they went by through the real process, through the guidance of a living master, and found their own mind had coined up everything. That's a tough question. The living master must come by coincidence in our life and open up the door to realization within, then we can find the real form of the living master inside us, then only he is real. You can only tentatively accept a human being as a master, till he can connect you with the higher self, and then you find out he was the master. You cannot ab initio say, okay, now I found this man, he may be a master. He may not be a master, he may be an imposter. There are so many masters going around here, but they are running a business. They do it to make money. The tradition of the masters which I follow is, the master never takes any money for his living from his disciples. So, I would wonder if a person has such higher consciousness, has these abilities, and is dependent upon me for my charity, to live, doesn't fit in. But this is not the only sign. I can give you a little small checklist. If you run into a master, and if he is a master who has his consciousness at that high level of the creator, these will be some of the most pervasive signs in such a master which you cannot ignore. One, if he is one with that creator, he will treat all as part of his, his own creation. He will never set up a separate group. These are my people, these are not my people. His message will be universal for the whole of humankind. Secondly, if he has reached that level of awareness, he will love everybody. His love will radiate from him, whatever he does. He will not hate or kill or injure people. Thirdly, if he has reached that level of creation, and this is all his show, he will not come to break up this show to convince you that he is a master. He will live according to the rules which he has himself set up, and will live and love you whether you like him or not. He will love you if you love him, he will love you if you don't love him. He will love you if you hate him. He will love you if you kill him. 
That will be destiny. If he doesn't do that, he hasn't reached that level of consciousness. So he doesn't have to come and prove himself. Secondly, finally, I don't know how many points I covered. The five problems which the mind creates and throws in our way in order to go through the law of karma, that means go through the laws of events and destiny, those five are called the five negative points of our attitude, those negativities in us, they disappear when we make spiritual progress. And in such a person, you will see very little of those negativities. What are those negativities? Anger, lust, greed, attachment and ego. If you find these five are strong in a person who says, I am the master, ignore him. It couldn't be. Also, if you want to test check your own progress on the spiritual path, you will find the more you spend time at the third eye center, more meditation you do, the more experiences you have, when you get up, you don't feel like getting mad at anybody. Anger is less. Lust is less. Greed is less. Attachments are less. Ego is less. Humility is more. Love for everybody is more. Automatically, you don't learn this. But if we only go to a ceremonial church, if we only go to a ceremonial, they say, love everybody. So you try to love everybody. You don't love everybody. But if you have practice of going in your own inner church, you will love everybody without trying. So these characteristics come in us and naturally there to be found in a master. So when you come across the true master, you will see all these signs. But the master will not say, accept me as a master. If you say, are you a master? He says, oh no, I am like you. You may be the master. Why? Because he doesn't have to let you go on any assumption. These true masters, they don't come and say, believe me because I am saying it. They say, believe me because you can see it. You can verify it inside your own self. Go within and verify what we are saying. So therefore, these masters when they come, although there is strong suspicion in our heart, there is something going on here. But they don't claim to be masters. They claim to be ordinary people and let us grow into knowledge when we find they are masters. Then they don't hide. Then they can say, yes. So I used to have these wonderful experiences going to my teacher and one person would come and say, tell me, are you a master? He said, no, I am not a master. I am not even a disciple. I am trying to be a good disciple. Another person would come and say, you read my heart. You knew everything there was that. He said, no, that's not a big deal. A third person would come and say, God, why are you doing this? And he would say, yes, it has to be done for this reason. He took different positions with different people he met according to how they saw him. So I found he was reflecting as a mirror. So the people as they saw him, they found him like that. So he did not permanently fix himself on a pedestal. If you fix the master on a pedestal, it becomes very hard to love such a man. When he comes and walks on the ground with us and holds our hand and can say, yes, I can walk with you and talk with you, he is a master. So these are the signs that you can check upon. But still I say, do not go by anybody's advice or anybody's opinion, whether so and so is a master or not. Go by your own experience. Any other question? Or comment? Yes. They always come again and again. But they won't come in the same body. They come again and again. Any enlightened soul who reaches that level of consciousness is that consciousness. Because when we talk of Christ consciousness, what is Christ consciousness? Christ consciousness is the consciousness where Jesus of Nazareth reached. Whoever reaches has the same experience. My master had a very interesting uh, disciple who was a gangster, a robber. He used to loot and kill people. And he decided to come and rob the little colony where the master and his disciples lived because he learned that a lot of gold was being collected to build a new temple and that the domes of the temple would be covered with gold. So he said, it's a good time for me to go and collect the gold. And he knew that the master used to give a discourse. Uh, and in the discourse, all the people used to go away. So that was a good time. So he went on a reconnaissance trip. He went to see which is the good time to rob that place. When he arrived there, he found everybody had gone to listen to the master. So he went from home to home and found some little children left behind, some caretakers. And he said, well, I wanted to meet somebody to give some gold. Where do you keep it? They said, oh, we keep it here, we keep it there. So he got all the information. And he said, he'll come with his gang and rob in no time. It's a very easy prey. When he had finished his reconnaissance and made his plans to rob the master's colony, 
then he wondered why people want to listen to this old man. What discourse does he give? So, out of curiosity, he went and stood behind uh, where the master was giving a discourse to 40, 50 people. So, he stood behind and at that time the master was saying, that resonance, that power, that word is ringing in everyone including gangsters and robbers. And master did like this and he thought he's talking to him. He said, how can he know? How can he find this out? So he, he said, I am going to see him. So he went to the master and he said, how did you know I was a robber and a gangster? The master said, I don't know you are a robber and a gangster. He said, but you said it. He said, I say it every day. You just came at the right time. <laughs> the, that robber and gangster could never go. He became one of the best disciples. His progress was faster because all that attention and intensity. He was an intense person. All the intensity that was going into robbing people, into scheming how to go in this, turned inward. And then he was very keen to see what happens to past masters. And he had a meeting with Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, and had a good conversation as he was in that century. So he could then come and share what his experiences were when he had contact with Jesus of Nazareth. But that is not necessary. To become a gangster, then come to a great master, then go and have contact with Jesus of Nazareth is good enough to meet the great master. So, there are historical points which you can reach through meditation and come in contact with the master. But when you are still sitting outside here and you want to rely upon a master who is not living in flesh, you can be duped by your own mind. People talk of this contest between God and devil. Our spirit and our soul is God. It's made of the same essence as God. And our mind is made of the same essence as the devil. There is no other devil except our own mind. Its own universal form is the devil. So, an ambassador of God is always inside us as our soul, our spirit. Ambassador of devil is always inside us as our own mind. And the whole conflict between soul and mind is the conflict between good and evil, between God and devil. It is not outside. So, if we rely upon our own mind to create a picture and an image of a, a non-living past master, then the devil can come up, the mind can come up and create an image and say, yes, I am that old man, I am Jesus, I am doing this. How do you know? So therefore, it is best to rely upon an enlightened one who has already reached that level which we are looking for in those masters and then getting guidance so that if the mind tries to deceive us, he can give a blow on us. Don't get deceived by your mind. The mind won't give us that lesson, but a living master will. So, by living master, I really mean living in flesh and blood. Yes? Is there any reason that instead of using this uh, mantra technique to uh, put your conscious receptive mind running in neutral, so to speak, and therefore inaccessible, that you put it into a background computational mode, put it to work where it's too busy with this computational mode, while you go with your attention into the next higher layers of consciousness? That's the best way. That works very well, I think. That's the best way. If you can use your mind as the computer, put this mantra into the computer. Don't attempt yourself. And then you go on your own trip. That's the best way. It works, yes, it does. But most of us can't use it as a computer because we identify with the mind. That's where the rub is. If we could distinguish, it's a good way. Any other question or comment or sharing? Yes. Thank you for sharing. Very good. The mantra given by a perfect living master prevents all negativity around you. No witchcraft is possible. No devil can attack you. No negative forces can come near you. The repetition of a mantra given to you by a perfect living master protects you from all these situations all the time. It's been verified over and over again. It's a very important thing and I'm glad you shared this. Last uh, comment or question from the back. And then uh, there is going to be an afterglow. So those who still have comments, sharing and questions, can reserve them for the afterglow uh, for which the address uh, can be taken from Ruth Thompson sitting at that corner. Yes. Yes. We are all potential living masters. The living master has been described as a philosopher's stone that is different from all other philosopher's stone. You know what is a philosopher's stone? A philosopher's stone is that which converts lead into gold. Tradition is a myth, of course, but that's how they say. A stone that can make lead or iron into gold is the philosopher's stone. 
But they say living master is different because he doesn't make you into gold, he makes you into himself, into a living master. So each one of the disciples of a living master becomes a living master because we are potentially all identical with the living master. And that consciousness is all there. It doesn't have to be brought from somewhere and put into us. It's already there today in each one of us. So the rest of it is realizing it and working towards our own total self, which is already within us. Thank you for the comment. And thank you very much for your patience. These, as I said, were sampler exercises. And I tried to put a lot of stuff in a short time. Some of it might have gone over your head, some under the head, some under the feet. I don't know. Uh, uh, sort it out later on. Uh, practice it, go over it, and see if it affects your life. Try it out. If you can uh, try some of this uh, sitting at the third eye center, go out and see if people find that you are better people, that you have less anger, less greed, you are different. If they start noticing then something is going on, go further and sit in the third eye center and practice this kind of meditation. Best of luck to all of you and thank you very much.